Welcome. My name is Carol Schick. I am the chair of the board at this church, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here. You are all so welcome, wherever, however, and whenever you are. You are all welcome. You, the wholeness of you, the entirety of you, entirety of you is welcome. There is no part that you need to check at the door or disregard or prop up because we are here to gather, to ponder, worship, and dream about a world that might be. Knox Met is an affirming ministry in downtown Regina on the sacred lands of Treaty 4 territory and the home of the Métis Michif Nation. Today, we are here to welcome and have the pleasure of having again with us uh, Reverend Mavis Peters. Mavis was a, a, a member of ours for many years, and we just loved her. We're happy that she went away to become ordained and even gladder that she's back for today. She is an ordained minister at two churches in Pictou County, Glasgow, Nova Scotia. So welcome home, Mavis. Our minister, Cam, is on holidays for a few weeks more, and then also in, Jul in August. And during that time, we're delighted to welcome many wonderful um, people who will be in speaking in the pulpit to enrich our spiritual exploration. You can find a summer schedule of Cam's comings and goings in the e-announcements, and, and we hope that you will uh, check out when he is uh, away and back if you need to speak to him. I want to thank those um, who are involved in today's service today, to Hart as well as Dana and Abby Mutchler for their gifts of music, voice, and song, to our ushers and greeters, and to Barbara who is facilitating decorations and flowers, and to David who is reading the scriptures today. We also thank Cecilia and Dan who are monitoring the live stream and online community. If you're online, please feel free to use the comments section to interact with one another and the service. Our children and youth programming lead, Jenny Crawl, will not be with us today. I want to thank all of you who are here in person. It's lovely to see your faces and for supporting our Pray Safe guidelines of wearing masks and um, staying a distance uh, from each other. We are still looking for people to read the scriptures on Sunday mornings coming up, and you can sign up for that in the Narthex or online. <clears throat> for more details about the life of Knox Met, please refer to the e-announcements, which are sent out at the uh, end of each week. And please see our Facebook page for the significant events that Knox Met recognizes and supports. I mentioned earlier that Knox Met is very proud to be an affirming congregation. And I wonder if anyone here noticed that last week we didn't have our pride flags on the communion table. The fact is that they had, been, they had disappeared somehow and we never found them before the service, although we have since ordered new ones. Um, they, they have disappeared in the past too and we've always been able to find them. But last week was different. And the one that you see on the table today has been loaned to us by another congregational member, Tony Bata. Hello, Tony. I hope you're watching. Thanks so much for the, lend, for the loan of this flag. I mentioned this problem of the disappearing flags in case, in case, and I hope not, that is taken as a sign of carelessness or indifference on the part of Knox Met toward 2S LGBTQI people. As a justice-seeking ministry, respect for all people is what we hope, and it should be clear that it is completely unacceptable that these flags are not with us now, in our own, the ones that we possess. We're still looking for them. We at Knox Met United are here to remind and affirm that you deserve to feel safe in your body. You deserve power and control. Your rage and sacredness and sadness are sacred. You are not alone in the work of building a safer, more just world. You are not alone in your fear. You are not alone in your hope. 
but it's okay if today is too soon to feel hopeful. For in life in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. And as we worship today, we bring forth both our personal and collective joys and concerns, hopes and laments. May God be with us all this morning. Morning. It's nice to come out from under the mask for a few minutes. Maybe. Oh, wow. Well. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Would you stand with me if you're able and let's call one another to worship. Come all you wondrous acts of God. Come lift us from our frantic pace. Come angel and come visitor. Come Jesus from your dwelling place. Surround these walls with faith and love. When human tongues from seeking speak, this house may echo praise. together. Praise to the Lord. Alleluia. Everybody praise the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. I had thought I would have a few minutes of welcome and announcements now, but I'm really glad that that's all been taken care of already. But um, I would just take a moment to say how pleased I am to be back here and to thank the members of this church who have known me and walked with me and encouraged me since 2012-ish when I first showed up and uh, since 2016 when I went to the Atlanta School of Theology in, um, in Halifax. So it's great to be back and to see you and uh, for all those online uh, that knew me, uh, hi, and I'll look up and see who, who was here when I get back home. So let's uh, stand once more and sing hymn 255, The Living God Be Praised.
may be seated. Let's take a moment to center ourselves and still clear our minds from all that is going on in our lives. And we will uh, voice this prayer in unison as you find it in your bulletin. Together then, Spirit God, would you blow again into our lives, moving us to action where we have grown stagnant and break down the walls that we build that separate us. Where our words divide, offer us translation. Where our fear overcomes, fill us with the fire of courage. Where our lives are stalled, fill our sails with wind, moving us forward into the unknown future. O God of wind and whisper, O God of roaring flame and flickering candle, would you fill us once again with the hope and promise of Pentecost. Amen. So I'm going to share with you, I'm not sure what you've been doing here during COVID, but at my two little congregations when we wanted to continue to share the peace of Christ with one another, but couldn't walk around and do our hugging and talking. We had a few different uh, ways. So I'm gonna show you the one that was the, the most common, the most favorite, and invite you then, uh, we'll take a few minutes for you to make eye contact with someone, put the peace of Christ in your hand, and say, peace of Christ be with you. And if you've caught their eyes, they may then return the peace of Christ. So the peace of Christ be with you all. Let's share. You can stand up and take a few minutes and find a few eyes. Anyone back here? Peace of Christ. I noticed in your uh, template that uh, Cam sent me for um, the summer service that you had uh, stories of our mission. I didn't know if that was usually uh, someone that came and read from the mission and service or what happened, but uh, I just took it upon myself to say, well, I think it's legitimate to sort of say that I'm your mission. Uh, I, I uh, sensed God's call shortly after I started attending here and I was leading a Bible study. And it's this church that gave its approval to the presbytery as it existed then for me to be a candidate and so on. So I'm just gonna briefly catch you up on what's been happening since I completed my Master of Divinity and was back here uh, doing my internship in Esterhazy. And I think I saw you just before I left. Having finished that internship, I went to Nova Scotia. So that was in the middle of COVID. And starting ministry, not only in a new place, but the very beginning start of your ministry to be during COVID was uh, something of a challenge, was difficult mainly, and for the whole past two years, just to get to know people when you can't visit freely and when you can't see them. It's hard enough to remember all new names without half a face. Shortly after I got there, I have two small churches. One is in uh, the town I live in called Hopewell, and the other is down valley and up the other side of a river in a tiny village called Bridgeville. Hopewell is also a village. They're both very small communities. So Hopewell, um, now that I'm here, I, I would say it's probably a bit larger than this. It's deeper and it has a wraparound balcony as well. And it has a high pulpit. Um, 
as well as the platform that's railed. There's the high pulpit from, I guess, the good old Presbyterian days, I'm not sure. And I'm determined before I leave, I'm gonna preach at least one sermon from there, but I haven't decided which one's gonna fit best. Shortly, I guess, the first council meeting I was at with them, feeling very insecure and not knowing how much I'm supposed to interact and all the rest of it, they mentioned that it was unfortunate that they had not been able in July to celebrate their 200th anniversary. And I just kind of gasped and interjected and said, that's incredible. You can't not celebrate that milestone. So very quickly, um, within about three weeks, we had organized uh, celebration service in the park that's just very close to us and uh, got invitations out to every former minister and, and the surrounding community and we had the 200th anniversary service of St. Columba in Hopewell and that was very well received and it felt like it gave me a, an initial way of feeling that I could actually be of help to these guys and get to know a few people and so on. So that was one specific uh, incident. Other than that, the churches have not been uh, doing anything except Sunday services when we can. We started them with drive-in services. So after I had been there for several weeks and had tried to put a few things sort of online, but they are not techie people, very few even use uh, email, that, and many don't have computers. The, Service is, is lousy, next to nothing, and uh, the folks are pretty well all over 70, so uh, uh, doing online services was not something they wanted. Um, so when we decided to have this drive-in service the first time, I stood on the stairs of St. Columba, and everybody that could came in their cars and parked facing me, lined up in a big long line, and uh, a few of them brought lawn chairs and sat in front, but most stayed in their cars. And that's how I met my congregation. Um, when I was introduced and then sort of said hi and so on, after I'm not sure how long it had been for them, they had been without a minister for a year and a half before I came, and then COVID had shut them down, and now we were together in a strange way, but we were together in worship. And I don't know what it is I sensed or how to describe it to you, but after I just took a pause, I said, let's join our hearts as I call you to worship. And it just, it just there was some kind of a whoosh. It just, it's like, we're back. We're back together, and God's here. It was a special moment. As I said, both congregations are elderly. One has a fair amount of money and the other does not. And they're both uh, seeing that there's no generation following them and they're not sure what is going to be happening in the years ahead. So I don't know how long I'll be able to serve there. I'm on a three-year appointment. So I'll be starting back into my third year now. I don't know whether that will be renewed. Or, uh, so there's a lot of questions, and, and I would really treasure your ongoing prayers for us to find and seek and know God's direction, that they don't, you know, disappear out of the community. They've been there a long time. I, uh, I'd be quite willing if anyone has a specific question, but I don't think there's anything more I really need to say. That gives you some idea. I have a, a quarter of a quadruplex modern building that I live in, which is in the middle of just field, I have virgin woods behind me. It's, it's very nice. I'm comfortable. I love the hills. It's all hills and rocks there. Most of my people are farmers or retired, and I drive through the woods and up the hills, and very rural, peaceful. And I have a cat now. <laughs> so, I think we can go on. Uh, let's sing again. Jesus, Joy of Loving Hearts, hymn 472.
As David comes to read the scriptures for us, let's join our hearts and our voices and say together the prayer of understanding. Spirit of the living God, turn on the light of truth and wake up our hearts by the words we now declare and ponder. In ancient stories, let us find fresh life, fresh hope, and fresh courage for witness in your world. Amen. Our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11. And I'm going to read selected verses, so if you're following in the bullet, online bulletin, you'll find this is just slightly longer or slightly different. It extends all the way to verses 1 to 16. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor Sorry, with righteousness he shall judge for the poor and decide with equity for the oppressed of the earth. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him and his dwelling shall be glorious. On that day, the Lord will rise, will again raise his hand to recover the remnant that is left of his people. He will raise a signal from the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather the dispersed to Judah from the four corners of the earth. So there shall be a highway from Assyria for the remnant that is left of his people as there was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt. Our psalm is Psalm 72, which you find at 790 in Voices United. And we will read together alternate verses of part one only. justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal heir, for judging your people rightly and upholding the poor with justice, that the mountains may bring forth peace for the people and the hills prosperity with justice. defend the cause of the poor among the people. Save the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. May the anointed live as long as the sun endures, as long as the moon from age to age. May your anointed be like rain falling upon the grass, like showers that water the earth. 
May your anointing be the one whose days justice shall flourish and the peace and in the earth. From the New Testament, our reading is from uh, one of the letters to the Romans, um, Romans chapter 15, verses 4 to 13. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by encouragement of the scriptures, we may have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according with, in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may, be, may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God for I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God, in order that he might confirm the promises given to the ancestors and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again, it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.
shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. We're most likely to hear this verse in the season of Advent. I think you all heard that, season of Advent. (laughs) That's a time when we're looking ahead at the birth, expecting the Messiah, the promised Messiah, the fulfillment of prophecy, and for uh, that sense of waiting and expecting. But I believe this verse can also be meaningful to us now in this period that we're hopefully calling post-advent, post-pandemic, post-pandemic. So I've entitled this message, Shoots and Stumps. And I invite you to consider with me as we go if there might be some old stumps on our horizons, on our landscape, whether it's our world or our denomination or our lives, just maybe on these dormant stumps, if we look closely, perhaps we'll find some new shoots rising out of them. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we invite you to invade this place. Thank you for your presence here among us, within us, between us, and between the words that are spoken and the words that are heard. May the word of God be revealed. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So I'd like you to take your bulletins and um, look at the cover, the picture on the front, and to kind of get that image in your mind, the old stump, and that little sprig, the new shoot. Shoots and stumps. Sometimes big old trees are removed. They're taking up too much water on the lawn, or they're just in the way visually, they've gotten too big for their space and they're not wanted anymore. So they're cut off. Sometimes right down to the ground, sometimes maybe a foot's left or a little bit higher. But I think in most people's minds, they're kind of an eyesore. The tree's gone, the stump is left. And I don't think it was till I was in um, Esther Hazy, in the little town of, the little village of Stockholm that I was living in, just a stone's throw down the highway from Esther Hazy. In little Stockholm, the first time I noticed that there were some stumps that had been creatively used. I'll, I'll give you an example. The first one I noticed had boards, two boards uh, off the top of it, and it made it look like a little house sitting on the middle of the lawn. And it kind of made me smile. And later in Esterhazy, I saw one that had a, a circular board put around the top part of it, painted black, and it looked like a top hat. So I'm wondering if anyone here has seen Regina. Does Regina have any decorated stumps? I just see shaking heads. Nobody's got a... Hmm. Oh, you've got one? In what hot springs is that? Okay. And people have made little houses and even one stump, there's kind of an opening in the bottom, you know, and so they made a door. Okay. It's just like a little wonderland. So there's a little wonderland being described here of a number of stumps with made into houses and even holes in the bottom made into like little doors. So they can be used creatively to disguise what that stump actually is. A dead tree that has no use and no more life. It's over, its life is over. 
So that gives us our stump. The shoot, of course, expresses new life, hope. Maybe it's not all dead. Maybe there's still some kind of future. There's been a couple of times in, in my own life personally when something that's been happening that seems meaningful and fulfilling somehow ends, gets chopped off like that tree. And sometimes you're left with this old stump in your life and you're wondering what happened. Why did that end? And I'll, I'll, I'd like to give you an example. Um, when I was in... Where did this go? There we are. When I was in Vancouver, when I had moved down from the high Arctic, uh, I, I sensed that I was supposed to put my, my sense of calling to work with prisoners together with my newfound faith and desire to serve God. And the church I was part of encouraged me to begin a prison ministry. So it was a slow step-by-step -step kind of start, um, trying to feel my way, what, what this was supposed to mean, recruiting people, training people, and starting. And it seemed to be taking off, but then without understanding why, it, it, it really closed down. And we didn't know where to go with it. It seemed like it had ended. It felt like I needed to just uh, give up the hope of developing a prison ministry through this church. And I was left with, with confusion, because it had started well. And I, I'm not going to take you through the whole story. It's too long. But with that, um, after a significant period of time of this being dead and dormant, and I'd given up on it, things moved and restarted without me. I had not a part of that. And a prison ministry took off. Uh, eventually, there were 13 churches in the Lower Mainland involved, and we went into eight different prisons. And it was a meaningful um, ministry that I, an outreach that I couldn't have predicted. It, it, uh, it was a healthy sprout, sprout that came out uh, what I hadn't, I had thought was dead. And it came back to life. So just a little sidebar from moving into our scripture that uh, is Isaiah's prophecy about these shoots and stumps. I'd like to reread a couple of verses from Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, chapter 15, 4 says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Simple, clear statement by Paul assuring us that we can turn to our scriptures, that would have been the Hebrew scriptures for him, that they will instruct us, encourage us, that we can find hope. And if ever there was a time when our world needs encouragement, that's now. And if ever there was a message that the world needs, it's a message of hope. Paul uh, mentions in a few uh, quotes that the root of Jesse is for all people, not only for the Hebrew people, but also for the Gentiles, all, all of us, all the non-Hebrews. Uh, my apologies if there's some Jewish people here, but it's for all of us. He quotes Isaiah a few times, and then in verse 12 and 13, again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles, and in him the Gentiles shall have hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is described as the God of hope. A definition, who is God to you? He's the God of hope. And the prayer that Paul is voicing there 
speaks of our having joy and peace as we believe so that we may abound in hope. Not just a little bit, but full of hope. And one of the keys in that verse, it says, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not something we can just make happen ourselves, but it's a work of God in us that can stir up this hope. And my prayer as I've been preparing this and thinking about coming and seeing you folks again, my prayer and my earnest desire is that each person here in some way will be encouraged today. These words from long ago from God's prophet brought hope to Israel. And may they also encourage us and those to whom we relate. Would you get your bulletin and and find that verse that's written right at the start of the service? I'd like us to say it together. Everybody see where I mean? It's in a little box. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may... Where did we go? (laughs) Okay, I was going to have you repeat it anyway because I want to change it just slightly and this time I'll try to stay with you. I don't know where I went or what happened, but... What I want to do as you're absorbing, I hope, and and, and letting this uh, verse speak to you, I want to switch the two yous and personalize them. So it's going to be filling me so that I. And if we did it um, not so well when we did it normally, let's see what we do when we switch it up. May the God of hope fill me with all joy and peace in believing, so that I may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When Isaiah spoke these words, Israel was being destroyed. After the reign of King David, you may Remember that there were many, many kings that followed him, and most of them chose to not follow God. There were a lot of prophets in those periods that were calling the people back to God. And the destruction, I think I've lost my mic, have I? No. Uh, The people that were living at that time would see their land being destroyed and their nation falling, and they were being taken into captivity. Their world was collapsing. They were devastated. And it was into those circumstances that Isaiah said, a shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse. Today, in our third world countries, they are um, falling. The onslaught of COVID continues in so many countries that don't have the vaccinations they need. And obviously, Ukraine is in a very similar place as here with seeing their country being destroyed. And there's a number of areas of pain that I don't need to rehearse because we all hear them with every speech and sermon and and prayer. The last few years have been difficult. In the midst of this time that we're living, We need hope. So as we're, as I'm talking and encouraging you, please be thinking if the Holy Spirit is stirring something in your own mind, if there's some sawed off stump in your life, whether it's recent or whether it's been standing and crumbling, whether it's in our city, or denominational life, or our faith community, or personal life, is there some stump? When it says the stump, the shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse, I'm wondering how many of you know who Jesse is. Can anyone tell me something about Jesse? 
the stump of Jesse. David's father, David, King David, the most famous king, his father was Jesse. Another question, other than in Sunday school, when you would have been told about Ruth, the Ruth that's, that said the verse that we often use in weddings, your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God. Little book of Ruth. If you haven't read it, it's a good read and it's simple, it's a delightful story. Ruth was a Moabite, a Moabitess, Moabite. And she married Naomi's son when Naomi came up from starvation, uh, famine in Bethlehem, I think. Married her son and then her son died and Naomi's husband died. And when Naomi decided to go back to Bethlehem, her daughter-in-law decided to leave her country and her family and to go with Naomi and care for her mother-in-law. So how does that relate to Jesse? Jesse is David's father. And Ruth, who came and remarried, was the grandmother of Jesse. So if you trace back through the line of David, which is the line through which Jesus came, the son of David, the promised son of David, we have um, Jesse as the father, and we have Ruth as the great-grandmother, a Moabite. So it's kind of an aside, but I think that ancestry is interesting because it gives credibility to the ancient stories the editors didn't write out the hard stuff. I think of that when I think of uh, some of the things that happened in King David's life, and it's in there, it's in the Bibles. The bad parts of the story are there too. They're very real characters. And uh, a fellow named Jamie Howison, a Benedictine, uh, penned something that I think is interesting here. He says, the authors could have left out Ruth and her story and her offspring. Thus, they would present their greatest king as being racially and ethnically pure. But in fact, they rather celebrate this unique turn in the story. It celebrates how a new beginning is brought forth from the tragedy of death and how the seeds of the house of David are actually sown in Moab, an enemy Gentile country. So as I mentioned, when Isaiah made this prophecy about the sprout, the shoot coming out, there was nothing around him that would give any evidence that this was going to happen. There was no promise of return after so many years, or the Babylonians were a, a dreadful race, very, very uh, warring and, and, what's the word, aggressive, violent, that's the word. They were going into exile without hope. Isaiah made this prophecy, and when his words were read later, when they were in exile, the words that had been written gave hope to those people. Isaiah was God's spokesman, and he says, a sprout's going to come. And years later, maybe when they were under Roman rule, again, they can give hope. So although Israel had been felled and nothing but a stump was left, from that stump, from the roots that were buried, a new branch would spring up and a tree would flourish. So I want to just leave you with the question that I've tried to leave hanging through this brief time. Is there a prison ministry in your life? A dream that you had? Something that you hoped you'd accomplish in your life? Or perhaps there's a relationship that's been severed and you don't know how it can ever be restored again. In our culture, in our day, the church itself, to most people, I think, is, is a dead stump that doesn't need to be there. It's not got its place of purpose and centrality anymore in our in our culture, in our, in our nation. 
What are some of the stumps that you might see? And has the Holy Spirit brought some dream or ministry or person? Is God stirring up, trying to stir up hope in you in some area? I encourage you to not give up, but to be watching, to be looking for those shoots. On if something that appears finished, lifeless, and left behind may come the sign of new life, so be searching for a green sprig, a tiny sprout. This is how hope gets its start. It emerges as a tiny tendril in an unexpected place. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your written word, for these who wrote words many years ago that they can still speak to us. We would ask today that these words of Scripture might give us hope. You are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Would you speak hope in our lives? Thank you for all that is happening. Help us to see what you may yet be calling us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn to him 472 and sing. Nope, that's the wrong one. Pardon me? 703. In the bulb there is a flower. Mm -hmm. 